This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Okay, so where are we now? Next page. Oh, we're on to Grey Owen and Adams, aren't we? How are you going to remember these three? Grey, Owen and Adams. How are you possibly going to remember these? Well, it's actually quite easy. It's actually quite easy. You can either remember it as Goa, which is a city in India. It used to be under Portuguese control, so Goa. But that's only going to give you the first letter. So what about this? Do you ever remember, you may not because you may be too young, but there was a, a, a Scottish international footballer called Eddie Gray. Do you remember Eddie Gray? No? That's probably before your time. But you must remember the uh, Michael Owen, who used to, I think, probably still does play for Manchester United. Michael Owen? Yeah, you remember? You don't remember Owen either. And Adam, Adams used to be the, the rock of the defence in the Arsenal defence, in the Arsenal team. In the Premier Football League, no, you're still not, it's not coming through, it's not remembering any bells. These were recent, these were within your lifetime, certainly. I can accept that you don't remember Eddie Gray, but you must remember Michael Owen and Adams. There must be some Owen and take that, I think. There must be? Owen and take that. I, I don't know, but I'm just looking at, um, at Dancer's top there, that's grey. So you can remember, just remember, the, and, and Linda's here, just remember the colour of their, their, their tops, their sweaters. They're grey, and you've got grey in your sweater as well. You're, you're, in fact, you're the only one that's missing. Why have you not got grey in yours? So grey we can remember. Owen, Michael Owen, and Adams, um, is the, he was the, the centre back for the Arsenal team. So that should help you to remember. Uh, it's on the ACCA's reading list of books. And they came up with a, a proposition. They, they came up with this and said that entities, companies, have to accept some degree of corporate social responsibility. They have to accept that a company has a, a role to play in society. And therefore... If you accept that the company is a member of society, then you must accept also that the company has to accept social responsibility, social accountability. Also accept that this may mean, they say, that we must also accept that the world may need to change. Because it could be that the world that we live in is not the ideal world, and therefore it could be that the world would need to change in order to get it to an ideal situation where companies do accept their responsibilities. And they came up with seven positions of social responsibility. They came up with the extreme right. The, the capitalists, they're called in textbooks and exam papers, they're called the pristine capitalists. Pristine or pure capitalists. Pristine means absolute, if I can spell it. It's like Christine, but with a P. The pristine capitalists. And they have an attitude, the, the pristine capitalist type company has an attitude that says, shareholder return is everything. That's, that's all we exist for. We exist to improve and increase and, and get as much possible shareholder return, total shareholder return, as we can. This is where we're looking for. In fact, it's explained for you on page 100. So if we go over the page, the pristine capitalists say uh, profit is what we're aiming for. How the world works now is, is pretty good. We accept how it is now. This is how we'd like it to continue. We want a liberal economy, a liberal democratic economy. And they accept the need that shareholders are most important. And shareholders themselves, the company thinks, shareholders themselves believe that this is a, the correct approach. And it's only one small step 
to see that the group has little or no concept of corporate social responsibility. Profit is what we're aiming for. The more profit we make, the better we have achieved our objective. Never mind society. Never mind social responsibility. Never mind the planet. If we can make profits now, that's what we're here for. The opportunists, over here on the extreme right, you've got these pristine capitalists. One step to the left, one step towards a most socially accepting, most acceptable regime, one step towards socialism is the opportunists. And their position, they're not that different from the capitalists. They believe that for a company to be successful, we need to seize the opportunities as they arise. Not bothered about society, I can see an opportunity and that will do for me. If I can make a profit, that's good. So it's an opportunistic organization. Also realize, they do realize, that in order for us to grow and be successful, we do need to accept some degree of corporate social responsibility. We can't just be so egoistic and so self-self-self as to ignore society, because if we're going to make a profit and take advantage of opportunities, then those opportunities must come our way, and they're only going to come our way if, if society allows them to come our way. People realize there should be at least a minimum acceptance of social responsibility, whether it's imposed on us by regulation or legislation, or whether we voluntarily realize this in our own interests. We do accept that we are a bit responsible. Then another step towards absolute socialism is the social contractors. Believing that entities only exist because society wants them to exist. Therefore we should operate in the interests of society. We should serve the needs of society. And a company's continued existence is only justified if society's needs continue to be serviced. The social ecologists. They propose that it's the companies that have damaged the environment and caused the problems. Do we know any companies which have recently damaged the environment? Do we? I can't think who. BP. Yeah, BP. And the social ecologists say it's the big organizations that have damaged the environment and it's therefore the big organizations that should pay. They should pay to repair the damage. Well, I think it's accepted. I think BP have accepted their responsibility and their liability to pay. Believe that companies should amend their operating and production processes. I think BP probably will. I think they'll probably put stricter controls and stricter procedures in when they're doing deep water, deep water drilling. And they become more aware of matters such as pollution, waste disposal and sustainability. Not only do they become more aware of it, they're actually positively using their uh, environmentally approved attitude as positive advertising. Only in this way can the quality of human life be improved. So these are our social ecologists, but we're getting more and more towards now extremes. I think I'm probably pretty much in the middle here. The pristine capitalists, the opportunists, the social contractor who accepts that he's in a contract with society. Then the social ecologist, and we're getting into an area where almost aggression is coming in. Almost aggression saying, you BP, you're going to have to pay for this, this is the damage you've done. Exxon Valdez, the Exxon oil company, had a, the, the previous major oil spillage at sea was when the Exxon Valdez sank off the coast of Scotland or some Canadian coast or some, some northern coast and killed lots of sea otters and sea life and, and damaged the beaches and oil was everywhere. Um, and we're getting a little bit aggressive now. We've got socialists next, page 101. The socialists 
they believe, and we're getting now really, we're getting to extremes, and we've still got two more categories after this, they believe that capital is dominant in social, economic and political life. And it's got to change. Capital is not the king. We should not be a capitalist society. We're going to have to reduce the extent of this dominance. The production of goods should be secondary. And the production of goods should be a secondary consideration. Social responsibility should be number one. Hmm. No, you can accept that if you want. Are you, are you tending over towards this area or would you rather we went back to social ecologists and maybe even social contractors? Where, where are you? Are you into the, the socialist line of thinking? Whatever it considers the production of goods is only a secondary consideration. What we should do is we shouldn't do anything if it's going to damage the environment, basically. Shouldn't do anything. If the environment is damaged, don't do it. They distrust accounting systems. I told you these people are extreme. How can you distrust an accounting system? Surely this is the fundamental of what the whole planet is based on. It's based on double entry bookkeeping, isn't it? Do you remember double entry bookkeeping, debits and credits? Yeah? Well, this, this, is that not the foundation for life? Or am I wrong here? I think that's, that's the whole basis for life. They distrust accounting systems and corporate social responsibility systems, but they don't have any idea of what we could replace it with. They just don't like it. And then we're getting really extreme now. The feminists. Why do you think I'm over here? <laughs> Why? So this is a mad group. They believe society is male-dominated. Can you believe that? Yeah? They think that society is male-dominated, socially, economically, politically, and in business. For heaven's sakes. I seem to remember reading that the heads of state of 32 different countries are, are women. Can you believe that? It means there's only 160 dominated by men. Ah, dominance is reflected by the masculine concepts of strength, power, aggression, competition, achievement, conflict. Male characteristics. To see the business world is lacking in the softer feminine characteristics of Compassion, cooperation, love, affection, tenderness. No comment from any of you, uh, you men? Any of you women want to say anything? They see that corporate social responsibility systems are inherently flawed because they miss off the, the female view. And to follow the male-dominated characteristics, they suggest, is not the best way of achieving and organizing a group of compassionate individuals, loving, tender, soft and gentle. And that would be a better world. And I agree with them. I'm over here. I'm on the extreme left with the feminists. I think this is a brilliant idea. I'm all in favour of a softer, more feminine, loving, affectionate world. I think it's excellent. I'm sure we could achieve immense profitability just by loving our competitor. The committed ecologists, we're over here. I'm hanging out of the window now, the committed ecologists. This is my quasi-nephew with his... With his um, paper shoes. They believe that the human race has no greater claim to the right to exist than any other group of living organisms, including those as yet undiscovered creatures of the deep. 
Our existing thinking is totally wrong, they say. We shouldn't be destroying natural habitats to build roads, build Manchester's third, air, third uh, runway, Manchester Airport third runway, build another runway at Ringway, another terminal at Ringway, at um, Heathrow. We shouldn't be doing it because we're destroying the natural habitats, destroying nature, destroying the planet. In addition, the farming of natural resources like fish and timber should at the very least be sustainable. We, should, we shouldn't be guilty of overfishing. Iceland has put itself into the... Um, it's been excluded from the European quotas on fishing. And they said, well, if you're going to include us and not in include us as, as part of your group, then we're not going to be bound by the rules of the group. So we're going to take 600,000 tonnes of, of the fish called cod we're going to take 600,000 tonnes. Now Europe has carved up this allocation of, of how many tonnes of this particular fish they're going to catch and suddenly Iceland say they're going to take an extra 600 as well. The cod stock, the stock of this fish called cod is going to be depleted, COD cod. It's going to be de depleted by Iceland stepping in. We shouldn't be destroying natural habitats but if we do, if we destroy the other animals, you meat eaters, if you're going to destroy other animals then you should surely make sure that there are enough of them left to carry on. Do you realize you're killing more species every... you're killing at least one species, I seem to remember hearing it on the radio, one species every three days is being eliminated from this earth. Do you know that? Is it because of eating? It's who? No, it's because it's not just because of it, it's because of pollution and, and global warming and and foresting, deforesting, destroying the Amazon just because people want wooden furniture. We don't have wooden furniture now at home. Our furniture is made of, of paper, of, of, of cardboard, and we just can't get it wet. We just recycled cardboard, stuff that other people have used. We don't have uh, any wood in the house at all. So we should be trying to leave more on this planet for future generations than we ourselves inherited. That's what we should be doing. This for your children. You women out there, when you do have a family, you women should be thinking about what can I do to protect the interests of my family still to be born? And, and my grandchildren, where you've not even got children yet, you're going to have to start thinking about your grandchildren as well. Committed ecologists. Just done. Corporate and personal ethical stances. Reverse of the positions adopted by companies and individual stakeholders within the companies. That's what we're looking at, that's the area we're considering. We need to think about the entity's position together with the position of the separate groups who are involved in the company, these stakeholder groups. And the four groups to consider the short-term shareholders and the long-term shareholders, the multiple stakeholder organizations and the shapers of society. Short-termers, from the company's point of view, they don't really care. We need to provide them with an adequate return just to keep them quiet. But from their point of view, they're looking for total shareholder return. We want a sensible, suitable return on our investment. Larger shareholders, the next group, that's not what they're looking for. They're not bothered about uh, a return on their investment in the form of dividend. They tend to be looking in the longer term for capital growth. They have very little short-term interest. So with the longer term shareholders, from the entity's point of view, it's necessary for us to keep them happy. Because they're the ones that keep us in business. They're the ones that have substantial holdings of shares. And if they choose to get rid of these substantial holdings of shares, that will rock the stock exchange market and it will create lack of confidence in the company. If suddenly there's a major tranche of shares comes onto the market, then the company could very well struggle. Credit rating could be reviewed. We could find it difficult to borrow funds, maybe to repay existing debt. And if we can't borrow the money, then we have problems paying our suppliers and getting materials to produce the goods that our customers want. 
And so we lose market share and there will be increased competition and falling profits and poor shelters. And ultimately, that's a... We'll have some going concern problems, won't we? We will. Yeah. Multiple stakeholder organizations, the entity will identify the multiple stakeholders. These people who hold great power and influence over the company and will consciously try to satisfy them. The multiple stakeholder itself expects the company to recognize our interest and expects the entity to respect them and act upon that recognition in the interests of the group. We're looking for respect from the company to the group. We are a major player in the group's existence. And if the group does upset us, then there will be deep consequences. We will exercise our influence. We will um, maybe remove directors from office, maybe question and give the management a hard time at the general meeting, maybe sell shares. We could do all sorts of things to damage the company. The company wants to keep us happy and they will do everything to satisfy their requirements. And the shapers, <coughs> entity will try to change society, the company will try to change the society by applying its own power. This change will be for the company's benefit but also for the benefit of society itself. This is the company's attitude. The company wants to improve society. Hopefully it will help us, and therefore it's not just pure deontology, it's teleology, both utilitarian and egoistic. But hopefully by changing society we will improve society, at the same time improving our own situation. For an individual, for an individual person, can't do much. Can't do much to change society. But if you get together with another individual and the two of you get together with two more and four more and eight more and sixteen more then you become a group and you become a group that the company should be recognizing and you can use your power or you can threaten to use your power and dictate the way that the company should be thinking. So the company needs to identify who these shapers, who these individuals are, who these small shareholders with their 14 shares, who they are. Because although I can do nothing individually, if I get together with others, then I can. Variables determining the cultural context of ethics and CSR. You've got four, apparently, four identified variables. Economic, legal, ethical and philanthropic. Um, economic clearly focuses on profitability, legal is on the legal side of it, the law side, ethical is what's the correct, the right, the ethical thing to do. And the philanthropic is because it's desirable. It's, it's, um, I got a lot of enjoyment out of being philanthropic, giving things, um, because it benefits society. You, well, I suppose you could say their own tuition was philanthropic, that they, they give as much as they do, for the benefit of society. And it's the worldwide society. I heard today we're up to 97,000 people. 97, we're getting near that 100,000. Different cultures view these matters in different ways. The easy way to illustrate the point is to consider European attitude in parallel with the attitude of the North Americans. What a silly comparison, isn't it really? I mean, how can you... How can you compare a population of, I don't know, 350 million with another population of 350 million and say, well, that population likes to do that and that population likes to do that? There's a saying in the UK that says, if you, if you show me a generalization, I shall show you a fool. Well, that itself is a generalization, isn't it? It's the same as saying 82% of statistics cannot be relied upon think about that. 82% of statistics cannot be relied upon. Oh, gosh. That is quite true. Sorry? That is quite true. It is true. It might be true. It might be true, but it's actually not reliable, is it? It's a statistic itself which is not reliable. No. For example, in inflation rate, an unemployment rate, our statistic office gives absolutely different than their that's why it's only 82% of statistics that can't be relied upon. 
Uh, different cultures. We're going to compare Europe and the USA, but I'm, I'm going to give you this with, what, again, an English expression. You need to take this with a pinch of salt, just a little bit of salt, just to, just to change the flavour of it a little bit, because you need to bear in mind that this is a generalisation, and this is what apparently textbooks have written and said that the European is different from the North American attitude. Economic... In Europe, we focus mainly on the actions of the company, decisions take into account public image and social acceptability, whereas apparently in the USA they focused almost entirely on profitability and uh, therefore total shareholder return. Legal. In Europe, we see government as a necessity. We accept the necessity for government, we accept the necessity for government interference, we accept therefore that there will be laws passed which will affect us and maybe not in our best interests and maybe not the way we want them to be passed. We see government as a law enforcer and we accept it as being in the position of being interfere and being able to interfere in our actions. Health and safety legislation it means slow production times, but it's in the interests of society. And it's followed by most. Um, think of another example, the lorries in the UK, I don't know if it's applicable throughout Europe, but the lorries have to have a, it's called a tachograph, and it measures the speed that a lorry is travelling at and it measures how long the driver has been resting or how long the lorry has been stopped. Do you have them here? Yeah. Well, it, it interferes, doesn't it? Because the lorry could make probably half as many again journeys on the driver, could make probably half as many again journeys if they didn't have to keep stopping and having these enforced rest periods. But on the other hand, it's for the benefit of society in terms of accidents happen with lorries because the lorry driver is, is tired and loses attention. In the USA, apparently, government is seen as an interference. It's an infringement of personal liberties. And therefore, their, their involvement, apparently, is minimal. I have no experience at all of American legal, economic, ethical, or philanthropic attitudes. I have no personal experience at all. So all I can do is give you the theory here. With reference to ethics on page 104, Ethical responsibility in Europe is at the forefront of European consciousness. And European businesses are continually aware of the ethics and ethical consequences of their actions. It even extends to the point of making ethical attitudes the subject of positive advertising. Uh, past exam question. Confirming in the minds of the public that their company is socially aware. There used to be a bank in the UK which I passed when I was going into work. It was called a cooperative bank. It was re the name was reduced to the co-op bank. And the tram that I used to travel in on um, passed three windows of the cooperative bank, very close to it. It just sort of went round a corner and there was the bank's windows on the corner. And the bank had blanked out its windows and put adverts in there that said, we never land lend money to companies involved in um, unfair trade practices. We never lend money to countries or companies based in apartheid um, regimes. Uh, we always lend money or we will, um, we are happy to lend money to companies involved in environmentally satisfactory programs. So they made a positive element out of this ethical stance that they had adopted. In the USA, as a result of the greater trust by the American public in the ethics of the U.S. corporations, <laughs> it's, it's generally accepted that U.S. corporations will be ethical. <laughs> I'm sorry, I find that funny. Do you not find that funny? Do you think American corporations are ethical? Mm, I've got one shake of the head. And, and what do you think? Yeah. All right. Say again. They have, to be. they have to be ethical. Yes, absolutely. But really, but really yes. They, they should be ethical. They should be ethical. But there again, we should all be ethical. There should be no need for law and regulation. We should all be ethical people. 
and stop eating animals. Philanthropic. In Europe, major focus is on regulatory systems to provide educational, recreational, cultural opportunities. For example, the opening and sponsorship of art galleries, theatres and museums. But if we rely upon the regulatory system, we rely upon central government to provide funding for some of these organisations. But we also rely on uh, local companies to sponsor schools and to assist in school programs, to assist in maybe hospitals and their organizations, friends of different hospitals and they have charity dances and they have raffles and they have Christmas balls and dances and they, and they, they raise money to buy expensive pieces of equipment for hospitals. The same as they do down the road, they, this, the International Women's Association down, down the road from here um, they are very active, raising a lot of money, uh, which they then distribute amongst selected charities. In the US, a greater focus is on the philanthropic acts of individuals rather than companies. So the Hearst Collection, the Getty Museum and the Bill Gates Foundation are just three examples of the philanthropist attitude of, of individuals rather than of companies. And in summary, therefore, Europe concentrates on the ethical and philanthropic actions which are legally enforced, but in the USA they concentrate their attention on the discretionary acts of individuals and corporations. Then we get a, the bones of an article written by Cameron, by Campbell, back in early part of 2009. And he's got the American Accounting Association approach to ethical issues. And he's subdivided this into the seven headings of facts, the ethical issues themselves, the norms and principles and expectations and values, then the alternative courses of action, uh, summarized down into the best course of action, where you then think about the consequences of those actions and reach the decision. This is the American, apparently, the American Associations, Accounting Association's ideas of how you would reach an ethical decision in a difficult situation. So identify the facts, and in an exam question, and it did come up in December 09, uh, identify the facts, because only then can you determine the ethical issues. Thinking about the ethical issues of independence, obedience and confidentiality as much as anything else. Then identify the, what is generally accepted in this situation, in, in this type of scenario. What are the accepted norms and values and, and principles? Uh, and taking into account then objectives, governance, independence and transparency. But then you've got the alternative courses of action. Shouldn't they do that? Could I do that? I could possibly do a third thing. So we've got these, these different possible courses of action. And we need to think about what is the best course of action and what the consequences will be if we take that action. And then make a decision. Now that was applicable in question four of the last exam. Might be. Might be. Might be quite. It wasn't specifically asked, but it could then have been applied uh, to the question, identifying the facts and the ethical issues, what you would normally expect the principles to say. Think about what we might do, what else we might do, what's the best one, what do we think is the best one. Think about the consequences and then make your decision as to what you should do. And it says there at the bottom, remember Fen A, B, C, D. Fen is a, a wetland, it's an area of wetland and particularly an area of wetland just north of London in uh, um, the Fen district it's called of Norwich and uh, of Norfolk and Suffolk and the Fen then is a wetland area and ABCD you can remember that yeah. you can remember ABCD and then we have Tucker, and Tucker was also mentioned in this article, Tucker's model for ethical decision making. This is a guide again as to what you should think about and the sequence in which you should think about it and then how you should then arrive at your decision. Is your decision going to be profitable? What's then the effects on profits of the different courses of action? 
Are there any legal limitations on these different courses? Is it fair, with reference to a balanced scorecard of treating stakeholders as fairly as we can? Is it right? Is it ethical? The ethical issues involved concerning different stakeholder groups. Are we being as fair as we can to all these different stakeholders? And is it sustainable? Whatever course of action we do take, it should be a course that we can continue into the future. We can't keep selling dinosaur eggs because there is a limited supply of dinosaur eggs. But if, we, if it is sustainable, if we can continue, if we can leave the planet with just as much scarce resource as we started, as the planet started when we arrived, then that will be sustainable. Profitable, legal, fair, right, sustainable. Remember, professional lecturers find responsible students. Profitable, legal, fair, right, sustainable.